So let's talk about the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law says that the pressure of a gas multiplied by its volume will equal the moles of that gas multiplied by some constant multiplied then by the temperature. All right. So this law basically relates certain properties of a gas at a certain point in time. All right. And namely, again, it's the pressure, right? P is pressure. Now, if you're taking physics, right, the pressure should be in pascals, okay, or newtons per meter squared. These are the same thing. The volume should then be in cubic meters, okay? The N then represents the number of moles. All right, so hopefully if you've taken physics, uh, you have also taken chemistry, hopefully this topic is a little familiar. If not, um, I don't know, whatever. The R value then, what you're gonna be using would be 8.31, okay? Uh, the units of that, I mean, we can write them out. The units of that would be joules per mole times Kelvin, okay? And the temperature here is going to be in Kelvin. Okay, so that is one way to frame the ideal gas law. Okay, now remember, it relates a values of a gas at a certain point in time. If you were taking chemistry, we can look at that same equation, PV equals nRT, and we would plug in now some different values. We would have atmospheres for pressure, we would have liters for volume, and is still the number of moles. R then changes, okay? It becomes 0 0.0821, all right, liter, blah, 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 whatever. And then temperature is going to be in Kelvin again. Okay, and actually I'll just give you the units here. It would be ATM liter over mole Kelvin. All right, so uh, that's the basic formula. There's one other formula you would need to know if you're taking physics, all right? It's going to be PV equals capital N times KT, all right? And let me put it as a lowercase k times KT. So basically this is all the same thing again. All right, pressure here would be in pascals or in newtons per square meter. This is in cubic meters. The capital N here now represents the number of molecules or atoms. The K then is known as the Boltzmann constant. Okay, so that's going to be 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23rd joules, joules per Kelvin. And then you might have guessed that now the temperature then is in Kelvin. All right. So one of these three formulas is what you're going to be dealing with. Now, there is one other formula that you should be familiar with. All right. I'm going to not derive it, but I'm just going to show you how it comes about. Remember this. I'm going to be working with this basic formula. You can do it for any one of them, but uh, it, I'm just going to choose that one to, to work with. So remember that it's this ideal gas law tells us that it's the pressure of a gas at a certain point in time multiplied by the volume of that gas at a certain point in time will equal the moles of that gas at a certain point in time multiplied by the R constant multiplied then by the temperature of that gas at a certain point in time. Now, if all of these variables here, I mean, except for R because that's a constant, right? But if all of these variables here are at a certain point in time, what that means is I could frame a problem talking about an initial point in time and then a final point in time, okay? In other words, I could say that the pressure of a gas initially should equal the volume of a gas initially multiplied by the initial moles multiplied by the initial temperature. I can also say then that the pressure finally of a gas, right, if the conditions were changing, if they had mentioned something like, hey, you had a certain tire that's filled with some air and then the temperature, you know, at a certain temperature and then the temperature dropped. What's the new pressure? Something like that. You're going to be looking to frame your problem this way where you have an initial set of conditions and a final set of conditions. All right. So this will be then the final volume times the final moles times R times then the final temperature. Now notice between these two equations, what's the same, right? What do you know will be constant for a fact? Depends on the question, basically, but you know 
at least R will be constant, right? The R's here should be definitely constant. So what I'm going to do is solve this top equation for R. Basically, just bring the initial moles and the initial temperature on over to the left-hand side, right, in the denominator. Just a simple cross-multiplication. So we would then have PI VI over NI TI will equal then R. And then same thing for the final equation here. We would have PF VF over NF TF, and that also equals R. Now remember, if these two things are the same thing, right, and this thing equals that, and this thing equals that, then guess what? These two are also equal to one another, right? So I can now create this new equation. I can now create an equation that looks like this, PI VI over NI TI will equal PF VF over NF TF. And guess what this is basically called? You might have seen this already if you have taken chemistry. This is called the combined gas law. Combined. Combined gas law. All right. Now, this formula here is used, as you can see, when conditions change, right? When you have some initial state of conditions and some final state of conditions. If the problem that's given does not mention one of the variables, like, for example, on a lot of questions, they don't even talk about the number of moles of gas, right? You, you have a certain tire, it's at a certain pressure and volume, okay, and at a certain temperature. And then all of a sudden, you know, you drive your car, the temperature gets a little hotter, right? And we're going to try to find, you know, how does the, I don't know, pressure change, assuming the volume stays the same. They don't mention anything about N. Now, if that's the case, you know what you do? You don't cry, you just cancel it. Easy, boom. If the problem doesn't mention it, just cancel it. So if the problem never even mentions, if you know you have some initial state and then some final state, and the problem doesn't say anything about temperature, they don't tell you it's constant, and they don't mention it at all, assume it's constant, and that means it'll cancel, all right? Because otherwise, if it changes, how would you know how, how much it changes, right? You can't assume that it changed by some amount, then what would it be? You couldn't solve it, all right? So these are the... Uh, four formulas that you'd definitely be uh, familiar with. If you're taking physics, you would want to know this formula, this formula, and this formula. If you're taking chemistry, you would want to know this formula, which is the same, obviously, as this with just different units, and this formula. Okay? So, uh, let's take a look at some practice. An adult can inhale about 450 cubic centimeters of atmospheric air in a single breath. If the temperature of the atmospheric air is 27 degrees Celsius, calculate the number of moles of gas that was inhaled. All right. So, right, pretend this is you. Look at that. Studly, right? And the problem is mentioning that here. I'll represent this little bubble as a the certain volume. So this is the amount of air, this particular volume here that I'll shade in. All right, this volume of air, whatever. Uh, why is there a dot there? So this volume of air is the volume that will then be inhaled into your mouth, right? Down your bronchioles, into your alveoli, whatever. And, uh, well, actually not the whole volume reaches that, reaches your alveoli, that is. But for, don't, anyway, that's fizz. Okay, so um, we have a certain value for this volume of air. Right, it says that the volume here of the air, as they mentioned to us in the problem, is going to be 450 cubic centimeters. That's fine. Now we know though that we're probably gonna to like to have this value in cubic meters. So why don't we just do a quick conversion? Get it out of the way. So we'll put centimeter on the bottom, meter on the top. You know that there is 100 centimeters in one meter. Now what you need to do is, since this is cubic centimeters, you have to now just simply cube this result. And what that does is now that means that you would have cubic centimeters and cubic meters. When you do the calculation, don't forget to also cube, right, your 100. So now, those centimeters will essentially cancel, and I'm going to take out the calculator and perform it. So 450 divided by 100 cubed. And I get 4.5... So I get a value of about 4.5 times 10 to the uh, minus fourth. Now that's cubic meters. All right, good. At least I know I have the right units now. Okay. 
What else do they tell me about this volume of air? Well, they also say uh, that it's atmospheric air. And basically what that means is that uh, we are at, let's just say sea level, or basically we're at one atmosphere of pressure, okay? So that's part of an assumption here that we have to make, uh, but I think it's a reasonable assumption. Even if you were up at a few altitudes, you know, a few, I, sh I should say, a few kilometers of altitude, it, it, it's relatively close, but this will be a good approximation. So let's say the pressure of this particular air that you are inhaling is gonna be 1.013 times 10 to the fifth Pascal. Remember, this is just memorized, knowing that that's the pressure at sea level or the general pressure you're going to use for uh, for these problems. Um, it also mentions now the temperature of that air. And the temperature they told us was 27 degrees Celsius. But we know we need this in Kelvin. Uh, so we got to add the 273 to that. And that just simply becomes now 300 Kelvin. Okay, so we got our temperature. And what are they asking us for now? They're asking us to calculate the number of moles, right? Okay. So the number of moles of gas is what we are after. Now, just a little aside here. Atmospheric air is not exclusively oxygen, okay? It is a combination of certain gases. Namely, the two most important, or the two, the two largest quantities, are going to be nitrogen and oxygen. That'll be important for the second part. But just remember that what, what we're doing is if I know the total volume and I know the total pressure of the gas. And I know the total temperature, the overall temperature. What that means is that I'm going to be finding the total number of moles of gas for everything. Even if this gas is a mixture of certain other gases, like nitrogen gas and oxygen gas, as I've mentioned. So when I set this up now, I am looking now for a formula that basically relates these variables to one another. And which one is the best? Well, it looks like the first one over there on the top. So why don't we write that down? So we have the pressure of a certain gas. And in this case, we're talking about the overall pressure. All right. So the overall pressure of a certain gas multiplied by the overall volume of that particular gas will equal then the total number of moles of that gas multiplied by the R constant multiplied by the temperature, the overall temperature of that whole gas. Now, when I talk about, I gave you a little tip down here. When I talk about being consistent, all right, with your identification of the variables. That's kind of what I mean here. When you're, when you're identifying the variables in a formula here, be consistent about how you identify each of them. Don't, don't, and, and also make it rich, right? Make it, make it vivid, make it, add more words. Don't just say PV equals NRT, right? And don't even just say pressure times volume equals mole times R times T because it's not rich enough. I can then give you problems where you follow this formula to a T and you're going to be wrong. All right. If you and your professor may do that, too. Right. You have to say, I want every time you read this formula, the pressure of a certain gas multiplied by the volume, the overall volume of that gas will equal then the total number of moles of that gas that we're talking about times R then multiplied by the total temperature. OK, so all I now need to do is basically solve this thing for N. So I have to divide out then R and T. Remember, we're trying to find the number of moles. RT go bye bye. And now here we have a formula where it's N will equal then the pressure of that gas multiplied by the volume of that gas uh, divided by then R multiplied by the temperature. And remember, since I'm talking about the total pressure of this atmospheric gas, I'm going to find the total number of moles that are present within that gas. So now, plugging in the values in, we have a 1.013 times 10 raised to the fifth, then multiplied by the volume. And that's now 4.5 times 10 to the minus fourth. Then divided by now R 8.31. If you're using Pascal and cubic meter, you will be using this R value. If you were using atmospheres for pressure and liters for volume, then you would be using this R. For the most part in physics, you will be using 8.31. Now, then take that and multiply it by the temperature in Kelvin, which was 300. And let's see what we get. Take out that handy dandy calculator, 0.103 times 10 to the fifth, multiply by 4.5 times 10 to the minus fourth, then divide that now by 8.31 times 300. And we get a value of about, uh, where should I put that? I'm just gonna scroll this, move this on up slightly, or on over slightly actually, so I can fit, oops, well, whole thing's gonna move. So I can fit it on in right there. So this is going to be about uh, 
I'm going to round 0 0.018 moles. 0 0.018 and then moles. Remember that represents the total number of moles here. Okay, now what's the next part of the problem? It says if air is about, an atmospheric air that is, is about 20% oxygen, calculate then the moles of oxygen that were inhaled. So this might make intuitive sense now if you understand the concept. I found the total number of moles that are present within this gaseous right, volume. We know that there exists 0 0.018 moles, total moles of gas. Now, I also mentioned that for the most part, it's nitrogen and oxygen. And let's assume for the time being that it's exactly 20% oxygen gas, which exists as diatomic oxygen. And the remaining 80% is diatomic nitrogen. All right. Now, what this means, if you know the total moles of all the gases in here, right, and the, the only two gas in here would be O2 and N2, how would you then find just the moles of O2? I think you might have an idea. You might be saying, well, should I just take 20% of this value? And if that's what you're saying, then you are correct. That's all you're going to do. That's all you need to do. All right. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to now just erase some of this work. And I'm going to now calculate that. Okay. So all we now need to do is going to be to take the total. And actually, I can make a little formula here for you. I can say that the moles of O2 or a particular gas, right, will equal the fraction of O2, all right, multiplied then by the total moles. And you can use this formula if you want, right? So if I wanted to find then the moles of nitrogen gas, I need to know the fraction of nitrogen gas and multiply that by the total moles, all right, of nitro, of, excuse me, of gas that was in the sample. So this will simply be now, the fraction of 20% is obviously 0.2, then you're going to multiply that by 0, uh, 0 0.018. And let's see what we get here. So we're going to get 0.2 times then 0 0.018. And we have a value now of about 0 0.0036. And that this now represents the moles of O2 specifically. right? And then if you were to find the moles of N2, and then you added them up, you added the moles of N2 and now the moles of O2. Guess what you'd find? You'd find the total here. Okay? So hopefully that makes some sense. So that's one way to have approached this particular problem. Okay? The other way to have approached it would have been to actually take 20% of the overall pressure. And if we were to do that, then we would have found the proper number of moles of oxygen, which is a different way to look at it. And that deals with then partial pressures and stuff like that. And um, I don't know. Should I should I explain it, guys? I hear a lot of no's out there. I hear a lot of no's, but I'm gonna I'm gonna do it anyway. I'm gonna do it anyway. All right. I'm going to go about it anyway. So this is the total pressure. Okay. So if I know the total volume, I use the total pressure. I use the overall temperature. I'm not really gonna say total temperature. I don't know what the heck that means. And then that would mean if I'm consistent, that means I'm finding the total number of moles of gas. But now watch. If I were to then use the total volume, okay, and then I use the pressure attributed to just oxygen, right? Or actually, let me do it this way. Let me do it this way. Instead of saying total, let me be, let me be very consistent, and then you'll see why they're the same. So I need to know then the volume of oxygen gas the pressure of oxygen gas, the temperature that that oxygen gas is at, and then the moles, I would find the moles of oxygen gas. Here's the consistency. Now let me ask you a question. The volume of oxygen, the volume of that oxygen gas, we can think about as the volume of that oxygen is, cont is, is contained within this entire three-dimensional sphere all right, that I drew. That's the total volume of oxygen. Okay, so they're basically the same here. This is going to be 4.5 times 10 to the minus fourth. What's then the pressure of that oxygen? Well, we have to know another, we have to know another idea here, and we can write something like this. I'll write this down in the memorize this section under the obvious, right? I mean, this is obvious. I love physics, right? Say it enough times and you'll believe it. 
Uh, so here we can write now the partial pressure of let's say oxygen will equal then the fraction of oxygen multiplied then by the total pressure. So this is basically right, it does, doesn't this formula look strikingly similar to what we just discussed with moles? So I can then simply take now the 0.2 and then multiply it by the total pressure, which was 1.013 times 10 to the uh, fifth. And then I can find the partial pressure or the pressure just attributed to oxygen here. So that's gonna be 0.2 times 1.013 times 10 to the fifth. And that works out to now be that the pressure, the partial pressure, all right, partial pressure of O2 will be equal to, and I keep, you know, here I'm using the pressure of O2, and now here I'm calling the partial pressure of O2. Uh, they're basically the same thing. Okay, not basically, I mean, they are the same thing. I guess technically I should be calling this partial pressure because it's only part of the uh, total gas. So this now works out to be 2.026 times 10 raised to the 1, 2, 3, 4. And that's in Pascal. All right, so I'm gonna use that now. 2.026 times 10 to the fourth. All right, the temperature of that oxygen, it's the same as that of nitrogen, it's the same as the total, right? It's still 300 Kelvin. And now I'm gonna look for the moles of oxygen. So what I'm gonna do again is I'm gonna use that same formula that I derived. The moles of the gas will equal the pressure times the volume over R times temperature. Now again, if I plug in now these values, the pressure was, and let me give myself a slight bit more room. We're gonna say N will then equal uh, 2.026 times 10 to the fourth, that's the pressure. The volume was 4.5 times 10 to the minus fourth. All now divided by R, which was 8.31, and then the temperature is gonna be 300. So, here we go. Let's calculate it. So we'll take that uh, 20,260, basically multiplied by 1.5 times 10 to the minus fourth, then divide it now by 8.31, and then times 300, and OMG-ness. Look at that, 36, basically, right? I mean, it's slightly off because of the rounding and whatnot, but when I say slightly off, I think I'm rounding this to then uh, point, uh, the six would be a seven, technically based on the numbers I'm using. But notice how it's basically the same thing, all right? So there, those are two methods to choose. Why am I spending so much time on this? Well, because I'm trying to show you different ways to look at the problems, okay? Depending upon the problem, you might like a particular method more than the other. And I don't know which one is gonna connect with you. So I show you multiple ways. Let's take a look at the next problem. An airtight cylindrical breathing tank, which measures 1.1 meters tall and has a radius of 0.045 meters, contains 1.24 times 10 to the 24 molecules of oxygen gas at a gauge pressure of 5.2 times 10 to the fifth Pascal. What is the temperature of, yeah, what is the temperature of the oxygen in the tank? All right, so to start off a problem like this, I'm sure you're, if your mind is not numbed from the problem we've just done, this problem will do it to you. Now what I wanna do is I want to try and create as vivid of a picture and detail as possible, all right? Now, it says that we're dealing with a cylindrical breathing tank and it's airtight. Okay, so let me draw that. Oh, what? What in the world? All right, so there's the cylindrical breathing tank. Now, it doesn't mention in the problem, but let's assume that this tank is like made out of steel, okay? And I'm now going to detail the height of it. So we know that this is 1.1 meters. And the radius of the tank, as they told us, is going to be uh, 0.045 meters. All right, great. We also know that there is going to be a certain number of oxygen molecules here that are present. Right, so if I had to do this, if I had to draw O2, and that's an O2 molecule, and an O2 molecule, and an O2 molecule, and an O2 molecule, etc., I would have to sit here probably until I'm dead, until I drew all of these molecules. I mean, we're talking about billions upon billions upon billions upon billions upon billions. So this is about 1.24 times 10 to the 24th molecules of oxygen. All right, now there's, it's pure oxygen, 
right? It doesn't say it says it contains oxygen gas. It doesn't say that, you know, it's not atmospheric air or anything. So we are to assume that there's only oxygen in this tank. And there are literally this many number or this many items of oxygen molecules floating around. All right. It also tells us then that the gauge pressure on the tank is 5.2 times 10 to the fifth Pascal. What that basically means is that like if you were to essentially hook up a little gauge here, right? You got your little gauge. Your gauge is going to read, this particular gauge right here is going to read 5.2 times 10 to the fifth Pascal. Okay. Now, please remember down here that whenever you're doing problems, you must use absolute pressure and not gauge pressure. And the reason for that is the same reason as why we use Kelvin here instead of Celsius in a lot of our calculations. Celsius temperature as well as Fahrenheit temperature is not a zero scale. It doesn't have an absolute zero, right? You know that Fahrenheit could be negative and you know Celsius can be negative, right? And depending upon the climate you live in, you probably know that for, for a, a sure fact. Um, whereas Kelvin temperature does have an absolute zero. You cannot have a negative Kelvin temperature. So similarly with gauge pressure, gauge pressure is kind of like the Celsius or kind of like the Fahrenheit. All right, it doesn't have a true zero. You know gauge pressure from possibly some problems can be negative. We don't like to then calculate with that when we're doing, when we're using our formulas. So you must use absolute pressure. All right, so there's a couple of things now that I may, not even a couple of things, just basically one thing I'm going to have to convert right off the bat. I don't want to forget to do it. Remember that this represents the gauge pressure. So we need a way to convert from gauge pressure to, to absolute pressure or vice versa. Remember this particular formula, that gauge pressure is equal to absolute pressure minus then 1.013 times, times 10 to the fifth. All right, Pascal. These are all in Pascal. So basically, I would add this term on over, and I, what I would do is I would take the gauge pressure, and I would add to it now, I would add to it this value, okay? So just to save, uh, you know what, I was just, all right, I'll write it out. Gauge pressure plus then 1.013 times 10 to the fifth times 10 to the fifth. And let's now do it. So 5.2 times 10 to the fifth. That's the gauge pressure. Now add to this basically atmospheric pressure, 10 to the fifth. And now we're going to get a value of, oh, why do I even need a calculator for this? I don't know. This should be 5. Point, and I technically, I guess I should stop it right here if I'm thinking about sig figs. And whatnot. So this is really going to be 6.2. I'll just leave it at 6.213. Screw it. I'm going to go all the way out there. All right. And this is now Pascal. This is the absolute pressure. Okay. So let's take a step back. All right. Let's label what we know. We know the absolute pressure now is going to be 6.213 times 10 to the fifth Pascals. We also know the number of molecules right, uh, that we're dealing with. So the number of molecules would be capital N, and that's going to be now 1.24 times 10 to the 24th, all right, molecules of O2. What else do we know? Uh, we also know that, well, we, we don't, we, we can find it. We don't know the volume at the moment, but we can find it. How can we find it? Well, they told us it's a cylindrical tank. What's the volume of a cylinder? It's going to be, what was that? Right, so pi r squared h, okay? That's the volume of a cylinder. And we have the values. So simply, what we can do is just take then pi, multiply it now by the r squared value, the radius of that cylinder is gonna be, as they, t you know, it's all in meters, so we're good here, 0 0.045 squared, multiply it by the height of 1.1. And we can then get the value. So why don't we just why don't we just do that right now? So pi times that point zero four five squared, multiply it then by one point one, and here we get a value now of about zero point zero zero, very basically seven, right? I mean zero zero seven zero zero. Okay, and this is going to be in cubic meters. All right, and last but not least, they are asking us to find the temperature. Right, they are asking us to find that temperature. So now that's my unknown here, right? That's my unknown. Let me just move this down ever so slightly again. It's getting a little tight in here. 
So the temperature now is the unknown. So guess what? What am I going to do now? Well, I'm going to now go and try and figure out if I have a formula that relates these four variables together. And we go to the right side and we realize, oh, look, formula number two. Great. So that's the one we're going to use. All right. So let's just get rid of some of this mumbo jumbo. And let's now do our calculation. So let's first write the formula out. I'm going to write it as uh, PV equals capital N times KT. Remember, so let's state this out fully. The pressure of a particular uh, volume of gas basically is multiplied by then that volume of gas, which is then equal to the number of molecules that are present in that volume of gas multiplied by the Boltzmann constant multiplied then by the total temperature of that gas. All right. What we're after is we're after the temperature. So let's solve for that, okay? So basically just divide out the molecule times K, divide out the molecule times the Boltzmann. And here we get now, we realize that the temperature will be equal to the pressure volume over molecule times the Boltzmann. And now we have everything in the right units. All we have to do is plug in. So this is going to be 6.213 times 10 raised to the fifth multiplied now by the volume which is 0 0.007 divided now by the number of molecules, which they uh, told us was 1.24 times 10 to the 24th, multiplied then by the Boltzmann constant, which is 1.38 times 10 to the uh, negative 23rd. Okay, and let's just plug it on in now. So let's see what we get. So we get 6.213 times 10 to the fifth, multiplied then by that value, okay, of 0 0.007. I use the exact value, so. Then divided by 1.24 times 10 to the 24th, multiplied then by 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23rd. All right, so here's the temperature now. So the temperature of this uh, item, right, is going to be now, uh, 254 Kelvin. All right, so 254 Kelvin. That's the temperature. All right. So that is the temperature of the oxygen that is in the tank. So if you were to go back to the picture over here, right, you know that the temperature inside of this tank, basically, and uh, I guess outside of the tank, we can assume it's in equilibrium. All right. It's going to now be 200, 254 Kelvin. All right. Okay. So that takes care of the first part. Now, let me just erase some of this work. All right. So now the second part is asking us for what? It says now, if the tank is then placed in a freezer at zero degrees Celsius now, okay? So maybe it is in a freezer already. I mean, if you already noticed, this is, this is basically below zero, all right? Uh, but I guess they're changing, you know, they're putting it into a different freezer. Um, if it's then placed in a freezer at zero degrees Celsius, how many molecules of oxygen will there be? Hmm. Interesting. So now what we might begin to think about is we might begin to think about and we might say, hmm, sounds like conditions are changing. Right? The temperature has changed now at zero degrees Celsius. Why don't we calculate that new temperature? Okay, we'll call it T. We'll call it. We'll call it TF for right now. So it's zero degrees Celsius, but you know you have to convert that to Kelvin, so you have to add 273. So now it's going to be 273 Kelvin. And you know that the gas originally started at 254. So you might say, oh, great, combined gas law. <clears throat> whoop de doo let's do it. Let's hold on one second, okay? Think about the context. Think about what's going on in the problem. You're taking this tank, okay, that's airtight, by the way. It's airtight. And you're going to take that tank, and you're going to place that tank now just in a freezer, right, that's at a different temperature. So you're literally just taking this tank, and you're going to transport it into, like, a freezer. It's airtight. How many molecules of oxygen will there be, then, once it's placed in the freezer? Think about it. Are these oxygen molecules, the only way that the number of molecules inside of this tank are going to change is if what happens? If there's a little leak, if there's a hole somewhere, 
if this thing gets cut down here, boom, then the number of molecules in here is going to change. But as long as this container is airtight, guess what? The number of molecules of oxygen will not change. So the answer to that question is actually 1.24 times 10 to the 24th molecules of O2. That's the answer. I, I, know, that I know some of you are like, what do you, what do you mean? You know, it sounds like conditions are changing and what's going on here. And I can't believe you're, what, what, you trick us, right? I can totally hear it. And uh, I did trick you a little bit. I tried to trick you a little bit um, because I want you to think about the context, the, 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 I want you to think about the details. I want you to think about the concept of the problem, all right? It's not the number of molecules that's changing here. What's actually going to be changing then? Well, the temperature is changing. And something as a result will also change. Okay. Let's write down the combined gas law. So we have PI VI over NI times TI is equal to PF VF over NF TF. Now, think about this. You have to think about the concept. We already talked about that the moles will not change, so we can cancel them. They're held constant, right? If you put the same number here as here, mathematically they would cancel. We do know, though, that the temperatures change. There is a certain initial temperature of 254, then there's a certain final temperature of 273. So that's not going to change. Let's think about this now. Does the volume of the tank change? Does the volume of the tank change? And you might say, well, no, the volume of the tank does not change. That's apparent, right? No matter if I take this tank, it's made of steel, and you might say, well, wait a minute, isn't there a certain volume expansion and contraction? And you know what? You'd be right. I mean, if, you, if you're thinking back to the, to the prior concepts in the chapter, you, you're right. I mean, this, the, the volume here will change ever so slightly, but we're going to assume that it's negligible here. All right, because it will be actually. It will be quite, quite, quite small. So the volume then of this tank basically will not change by any significant amount. Okay, whether you put this in a freezer at zero degrees Celsius or right now it's at 254 uh, Kelvin, which is basically, you know, some negative 20 something or other, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter. Okay, the, the volume of that tank's not going to change. But if you if you were to ask yourself, does the volume then of the oxygen change? That becomes a little iffy, right? In terms of the concept, you might be saying, well, does this contract in here whatsoever? You have to remember one of the main principles of a gas. And this is why sometimes thinking through theory can help you, especially if especially if you're struggling. The Remember, a gas will always fill the full volume of the container that it is in. That's what it's meant by the volume of the gas. So if this oxygen is placed within a rigid container, rigid container, the oxygen, the oxygen molecules will totally fill up the entire container. And therefore, the volume of that oxygen gas that's inside the container will be equal to the volume of that container. So hopefully that makes sense. So what that means now is that the volume is held constant. So now the pressure... The pressure will change. And you have seen, I'm sure you have seen examples of this before. All right. You might have seen it with maybe soft drinks or something like that. You know, as the temperature changes, the pressure of that gas inside the, the contents of the bottle, you might notice might change. You might notice it with your tires. All right. Even though the volume does change there a little bit, if they're really, really pumped up, there won't be a significant change in volume there. But you know, you might, you might notice this uh, in some common day applications. So here's the thing. It's the pressure that's going to change. Now, the, I know the question and asked to solve for pressure, but you know what? I'm going to do it anyway. So let's find the final pressure. Okay. So we have to find the final pressure. And solving for the final pressure, right? Actually, let me just do this. Let me rewrite the equation. So it's PI over TI will then be equal to PF over TF. And if we want to solve for the final pressure, all you got to simply do is just take this and move it on up, right? Whatever in the denominator over here, you can take and move it into the numerator over there. And that's it. Basically doing a cross multiplication. So here's the formula. So now all we have to do is just plug in. The final temperature was the 273. The initial pressure, again, has to be the absolute pressure. All right. Um, the initial pressure, what was it now that I erased it? Basically, we just have to take this and add to it. Uh, the 1.013, so that was 6.213, right, times 10 to the uh, fifth. 
and then divide that by the initial temperature, which was the 254. And let's see what it let's see what it is. So 273 times then 6.213 times 10 to the fifth. Then divide that now by 254. And here it is. We now have a final absolute pressure, 6.68 or so, times 10 raised to the 3 4 fifth. And that's in Pascal. Remember, this is absolute temperature. If that's what the problem had asked for, then you'd be done. But imagine they asked you now for the gauge pressure. How does the gauge pressure change? Well, simple. You have to remember that formula, right? We know the formula that the absolute pressure, or I should say this, that the gauge pressure is equal to the absolute pressure minus then 1.013 times 10 to the fifth. So I got to do is plug in this absolute pressure into the formula. Let's see how it's going to change, all right? So minus then, so we're going to minus 1.013 times 10 to the fifth. And we get a value now of about 5.6 or 5.7-ish, all right? So the gauge pressure now would be equal to about 5.7 times 10 to the fifth. And notice now if you compare the final gauge pressure here to the initial gauge pressure over here, the pressure has gone up. All right, and you know that that's the case, right? As temperature goes up, the, the uh, pressure generally goes up. You know that with your car tires, right? That's why you want to measure the pressure when the tires are cold. Uh, I mean, you can measure them when they're hot too, but I mean, all the all, all the guidelines are for when they're cold. So the recommendations, those pressures are when their tires are cold. But you know that, you know, as the tires heat up, the uh, pressure inside of those tires goes up as well. So hopefully this problem connects to something you're familiar with. Guys, I really appreciate it very much. If you're still with me at this point, kudos to you. All right. I really try to explain as well as possible, as detailed as possible. I think about how the problems might change. Um, I'm really trying to you know, give you all, all that I can think about here. <laughs> all right, so I, I really do hope this helps you out. And if I'm able to help you out at all, if you wouldn't mind giving us a hand, just hit that subscribe button and tell your friends, all right? We want you all to do well. Take care.